How on earth do you replace someone like Armando Baycott, who has been an absolute legend at North Carolina? Very simply put, you can't. You are Locked on Tar Heels, your daily podcast on the UNC Tar Heels, part of the Locked on Podcast Network, your team every day. Hey there, what's up? It's Monday, April 8th, 2024. Welcome into the Locked on Tar Heels podcast, the only daily North Carolina show out there. I'm your host, Isaac Shade, and you've joined us at The Place to get your Tar Heels content every single day. Thanks for making us your first listen or watch, and I want to say a big shout out to all of you everydayers out there joining us. Today's episode is brought to you by LinkedIn. These days, every new potential hire can feel like a high stakes wager for your small business. That's why LinkedIn Jobs helps find the right people for your team faster and for free. Post your job right now at linkedin.com slash locked on college terms and conditions apply. Coming up on the show today, we're going to talk about the first transfer news of the portal season for Carolina. James Aconquo is out the door. Uh, got some Tar Heels voted into the Hall of Fame and RJ Davis continues to rack up accolades. We're going to get to all that. But first, two quick shout outs. Shout out to the leaders of the Locked on Tar Heels Bracket Challenge. We've got Tux Tar Heels leading the way right now in the 99th percentile amongst all brackets. Very well done. Second place is UNC Tar Heels BB. And third place is Tar Heels Fans 95. Shouts to all of you. We'll uh, recap it tomorrow after the championship is final. And also, shout out to South Carolina for their undefeated national championship on the women's side. Um, very classy by Coach Don Staley after the game to shout out Caitlin Clark as well. All right. Camilla Cardoso, she was the story of the game for South Carolina. And I say that to transition us into talking about Armando Baycott, the big man that's been the big deal in the lane for Carolina now for the last five seasons. But that's done and gone and over. Unfortunately, Armando is out the door. And so the first time, for half a decade, we will now say, all right, where does North Carolina turn on the interior? And let's be honest, there is no way to replace Armando Baycott. When, when you talk about that, somebody who literally has been a legend in this North Carolina program, leading the way all time in rebounds and double doubles and things like that. And I know there's the fifth year asterisk thing, whatever, fine. But he was the leading rebounder even before that, right? So you got those things. So what it means, and and we're going to have plenty of time to properly send Armando off and and to remember him um, as we go throughout this offseason. But as we're in the immediate aftermath of the season, I know most people's brains are already on, so where do we turn next? And let's think about it through the eyes of Hubert Davis. He was obviously assist, an assistant coach as Armando came in, has been a head coach for three of Armando's five years. And so really, this is the first time that Coach Davis will have the opportunity to get whomever it is that he wants in at that role. And I know he could have in other, you know, in not so uh, fine a way sent Armando packing if he wanted to or Jalen Washington, whatever it is, but truly. This is the time when Coach Davis can really, really now put his fingerprint on what he wants. And I think it's going to be very telling for what he's looking for as his starting five. And I think the big place to start is the question that a lot of people are asking. Is North Carolina's starting center for the 2024-25 season already on the roster or not? And basically that means I'm asking is Jalen Washington your starting five or is he not? And it really feels, as I've talked to people, it really feels like the fan base is divided over that question. A lot of people say, you've already got a stretch big on your roster, while a lot of people say, there is no way that Jalen Washington is strong enough or you know, uh, to, ha- has enough, uh, what's the word I'm looking for here? Endurance, that's it. Um, to be able to stand up to an ACC gauntlet of a season with those kind of bigs um, whom we've seen be able to push Jay Wash around at times. And, and we have to keep in mind, remembering that this is just his second healthy offseason since early high school. Maybe there's the opportunity to bulk up and get bigger and have that. 
And ultimately, that's obviously up to the coaching staff and none of us. But what I want to do today, because I kind of lean as of right now towards Carolina does not have their starting five on the roster right now. You might wholeheartedly disagree with me, and that's great and fine, and I want to hear that. But what I want to do today is just kind of explore some of the possibilities of what North Carolina might go after in the transfer portal, because I believe, and, and we've even heard just from some of the names, that it seems like they will. So I want to break it up into an armando -y category, kind of like a, a more bulky big, who might not necessarily be a shooting big, and then the uh, the less bulky, less armando -y category as well, and then maybe some, some um, types that might not be in the transfer portal yet, but is the type of player that Coach Davis uh, would go after. So in the Armando Wee category, I've got three names for us, and these are guys that are all in the transfer portal. Number one is Great Osibor, whose name you might never have heard of, but he's somebody I tracked all year this year at Utah State, played for Danny Sprinkle, was the Mountain West Player of the Year. Danny Sprinkle is now off to be the head coach at Washington, now a Big Ten school. And so what, the first question to ask is, is Great Osibor just going to follow his coach up to Washington? He's a little bit undersized for what Armando would have been, 6'8", 245, but you, you've seen others do that. Uh, Osibor is also in the NBA draft process, 17.7 <clears throat> points a game last year, nine rebounds a game, 2.8 assists, 1.3 steals, 1.4 blocks. <laughs> He's got one year of eligibility left, left, is not much of a shooter, has put up some in his career, kind of similar to Armando, but would be sort of a little bit shorter version of having Armando all over again. Another one, and a, a name you might be more familiar with, is Vlad Golden, who uh, is transferring out of FAU, was one of the starters for that Final Four team a year ago, there again year with Dusty May. And so that that's part of the question, similar to Great Osibor, is... Would Vlad follow Dusty May up to Michigan, where he is now the head coach? In fact, my understanding is they they are um, kind of you know obviously uh, it would make sense there. And he is he is a bigger Armando seven one, so taller, about the, a little bit less uh, bulk to him though two forty in terms of weight. 15.7 points, 6.9 rebounds, 1.6 blocks this past year. So not the not the rebounder that Armando is, but did have more of an offensive presence from scoring standpoint this year. He is, when I say not much of a shooter, he is literally not a shooter. Has never attempted a three in his four years at FAU. Um, and so the, speaking of which, four years. So he's got just one year left as well would be a COVID eligibility. Another one. That, that I kind of look at is Cliff Omarui coming out of Rutgers. He's 6'11", 240, so pretty similar to Armando. Has been at Rutgers all four years, so he too has one year of eligibility left. 10.4 points, 8.3 boards last year, this most recent year, which was down from 13.2, 9.6 the year before. So kind of similar numbers to where Armando has been. Similar thing, not much of a shooter, one of five from three this past year. So those three guys all live in that kind of Armando Baycott lane to me. In the less bulky, more of a shooter sort of way, you've got Maxime Reynaud from um, Stanford that we've already talked about. If you want to hear more about him, just go look back in the Locked on Tar Heels feed. In fact, I clipped it out to where it's just a clip of him. But a 7'1", 235 guy, so really tall, really slender. Um, one year of eligibility left and, and would be more of a shooter, less of a defensive presence. So a lot of people would say, so then why not get somebody else? Because that sounds very jaywashy. And I hear that. Uh, another one that it sounds like Carolina is, in fact, has either reached out to or plans to is Danny Wolf from Yale, who, interestingly enough, helped knock off Auburn in the NCAA tournament this year. Um, he is seven foot 255, so does have some more girth to him. Interestingly, has two years of eligibility left. That's intriguing to me. He is a shooter, 34.5% from three on 2.6 attempts per game. So it's not like shooting a ton, but enough to keep defenses honest from outside. Last year at Yale, averaged 14.1 points a game, had 9.7 boards, so just shy of averaging a double-double, 2.4 assists, and 1.3 blocks. 
he is actually visiting Michigan this weekend. So that would be interesting. You know, we just talked about would Vlad Golden go be with his coach in Michigan. Danny Wolf sounds like is meeting with them as well. So we'll have to keep our eyes on that. But that's some of the the Armando prototype kind of guys and then some of the more slender ability to shoot kind of guys. Let me just pose a couple guys that are not in the portal, but maybe more of a fit for what kind of a balance between the non-shooting Armando kind of guy and the shooting but not bulky kind of guy. The first person I think about that I wouldn't be surprised if Coach Davis is looking at is someone like Janai Broom from Auburn. I love this dude's game and what he would do and also how appropriate to go take someone from Auburn like they did to us with Walker Kessler, right? Broom is 6'10", 235. He's got one year left. He played two at Moorhead State, two at Auburn. This past season had the third third best player efficiency rating in the nation behind two dudes that are playing for the national championship tonight in Zach Eady and Donovan Klingon. That's fantastic. Last year at Auburn, 16.5 points a game, 8.5 boards, 2.2 assists, and 2.2 blocks. So he does bring some more defensive pressure uh, and, and rim protection along with that scoring and rebounding. Oh, and by the way, 35.4% from three on 2.3 attempts per game, made 28 of his 79 attempts, but he also was just shy of 60% from two, 59.6%. That to me is exactly who I want for North Carolina. Now, again, he's not in the transfer portal, but if Janai Broom was to enter or someone with that type of, of, capability. That is exactly what I want for North Carolina. A another one uh, who, you know, there's been lots of rumors about, but they've been shut down. But again, just kind of a prototype who you're looking at is Clemson's PJ Hall. And again, hear me, there is nothing but rumors. Everything I've heard is been shut down like by PJ's mom. And so PJ Hall, uh, a less foul prone version of PJ Hall would be another kind of like, I like this a lot. Exactly like Janai Broom, 6'10, 235. He's got one year left. He played four at Clemson. Based on what happened, if he chooses to come back, I would imagine he just comes right back to Clemson. This past year, 18.3 points, 6.4 boards, 1.4 assists, 1.4 blocks, 31.5% from three on 4.6 attempts per game. So shooting more than Broom is. 77.9% from the free throw line on 4.5 attempts. So some of the numbers are down from where Brooms are, but some of the other numbers I kind of like a little bit better. I would take Broom over Hall personally, especially because of the foul issues. But those are just two kind of guys that it's like, I think if they were in the portal, that's exactly what Hubert Davis would be going at to help replace Armando Baycott, which again, you can never truly fully do. But how do you kind of figure out what you want to be now? So we'll keep our eyes on this. Lots more conversation to have about it. But we'll just watch to see where Carolina truly ends up going as they try to fill out the scholarships. Now, speaking of which, Carolina had their first real roster movement news on Friday in the form of James Aconquo entering the transfer portal, which says even more about the conversation we just had about trying to replace Armando Baycott. We'll get to that conversation in just a second. Right after I tell you about LinkedIn, when you're hiring for your small business, you want to find quality professionals that are right for the role. That's why you got to check out LinkedIn Jobs, which has the tools to help find the right professionals for your team faster and for free. Thankfully, it's not just another job board. LinkedIn has a vast network of more than a billion professionals, making it the best place to hire. It gives you access to professionals you can't find anywhere else and does all of that while making the process easy and intuitive. So easy when you got that many quality candidates. It's so easy to hire. So easy, in fact, that 86% of small businesses get a qualified candidate within 24 hours. LinkedIn knows that small businesses wear so many hats and might not have the time or resources to hire. So they're constantly finding ways to make that process easier for you. For example, they recently launched a job description writing uh, feature to help you do that because you don't have the time or maybe the ability to do so. I love it. So if you want to help get, get some help from LinkedIn, post your job for free right now at linkedin.com slash locked on college. Once again, that's linkedin.com slash locked on college to post your job for free. Terms and conditions apply. 
Friday morning, we got the news that James Aconquo was entering the transfer portal from North Carolina. It, it's kind of weird because after last year where there were seven and they came fast and furious, it's not been happening yet this year. And then Friday, it was just kind of like, oh, James Aconquo is entering the transfer portal. Also, unlike last year, this is a guy that just, you know, didn't have much impact in terms of on the court success this year. I think he had a big impact on this team in terms of uh, camaraderie and just being a good natured guy and, and somebody that really helps build that togetherness. And so, you know, James Aconquo was that last piece to last year's roster, helped bring some some depth some insurance for Armando Baycott if if he should get into injury or, or things like that. And so just want to say a word of thanks for James is saying, hey, I, I'm going to give this next year to the University of North Carolina. We'll, we'll wait to see where he ends up. I wouldn't be surprised um, just because he didn't have much playing time. If he looked to maybe go down to a mid-major level where he could get uh, a bigger opportunity to see the court more. For those watching on YouTube, you can see the scholarship chart posted here to look at. Um, if you're not watching, if you're listening, you can go find it on my Twitter profile. I posted it on Friday after a Conquo's entry into the transfer portal. So prior to this, North Carolina had two of their 13 scholarships open for next school year. As of now, there are three available. And as a reminder, there are, you get 13 total. Carolina only used 11 last year. And so if they were to only go back to 11, they would only utilize one more, but they can utilize three. And obviously we don't know what other movement there will be in terms of other guys that have to make decisions. But it's really interesting when you think back to this time last year, Carolina, the coaching staff had to essentially concoct an entire new roster. They only had four returning players, RJ Davis, Armando Baycott, Jalen Washington, and Seth Trimble. Now, to be fair, when two of those four are RJ Davis and Armando Baycott, you got the inside covered, you got the outside covered front court and back court. And then you want to fill in with guys that are very complimentary pieces to that. And that's exactly what the coaching staff was able to do, but they were basically needing to bring in a whole new rotation to be part of Carolina's team this year. And boy, did they do that well, but this year where things stand is it feels like, hey, you really just want to target a few specific positions and areas of need. Now, it might turn out that there are more of those depending on what somebody like RJ Davis or Harrison Ingram decide to do. But as of right now, as we look at it from the outside in, it really feels like there are a few specific positions because right now it seems like you could have three returning pillars in the form of RJ Davis Harrison Ingram, and Elliot Cadeau. That's three-fifths of your starting lineup. Now, obviously, we don't know what will happen, and we have to wait to see. But until that happens, let's say those three guys are back in. In which case, those two critical areas of target uh, for, for who to bring in are the three, the small forward position, and the five, the center position. In terms of what I'd like Carolina to find from both of those at the three, I'm looking for positional size. Think Cam Johnson, who was a six foot nine three, who could shoot, who could get out and transition, dunk, defend a little bit, who a marksman, tough nosed. Think about what Cormac Ryan brought this year. A little bit shorter, obviously, than Cam at six five, but good grief. Uh, Cormac Ryan will do anything for his team. Tough nosed, get right into you, do whatever needs to happen. In terms of the five, I'm looking for somebody like those guys we just talked about in segment one that can be a space eater, whether uh, they bring rim protection as a seven footer, whether they have a little bit of girth and can disrupt you uh, like we talked about with somebody like a Janai Broom, or you think to some other people that Carolina has faced um, like, uh, oh, you know, what's his name from Miami? That's completely not coming to my brain right now for some reason. But somebody like that, that while they might be a little bit undersized, um, is able to be disruptive inside and, and things like that. And so eventually his name is going to come to me and it's absolutely killing me right now that I can't think of it. Uh, I'm sure you're all yelling it at me. Uh, Norchad Omir just came to me. There we go. Okay. Somebody like that. So um, somebody that can um, ideally has 
that Janai Broom game, that PJ Hollish game, somebody that can bang inside, unlike Jalen Washington, but also somebody that can step out and hit it like Jalen Washington, right? So you really need a balance there. Um, and, and it's really interesting because last year, as I said, it was critical to find that Oconquo role to be the backup, someone who didn't mind being the backup, but could provide specific Baycott depth insurance. This year, what you're looking for is the Baycott. You need the starter now. Again, depending on what you think Jalen Washington is or uh, what James Brown is bringing when he comes in, right? Like all of those are in consideration. So as you look at the shape of things, this whole conversation about James Aconquo leaving kind of plays into the conversation we just had because you just have now lost your two bulkiest bigs in Armando Baycott and James Aconquo. So you need girth, even if you do go get a, a wolf, um, a Danny Wolf from Yale. You need somebody who can bang around a little bit because what are you going to do if you come up against somebody like DJ Burns from NC State, right? Like you're you're just in a world of trouble there because you got nobody that that can contend with that. Um, that. That's the trouble. You look at Duke this year, right? We've talked so much. That was their issue. Kyle Filipowski was playing the five. And any time they went up against a true center, they, they could they could not contend. Carolina cannot find themselves in that position next year. So that's why the Oconquo news um, has to be a, a position that needs to be addressed, the center with somebody that can bang inside. So we'll keep our eyes on that. But as of right now, we know that there are three scholarships available. Obviously, we continue to wait on news from RJ Davis, from Harrison Ingram, um, from guys like Seth Trimble and Jalen Washington and Elliot Cadeau. You just, this day and age, I know it seems weird, but until you have confirmation that somebody says I'm back, you just you just can't confirm anything. Now, once we get past the transfer portal uh, closing window and no news, at that point, no news is good news. But right now, you want news, right? And so just as a reminder about the transfer portal timeline, it has been shrunk to 45 days. It was 60 last year. It began on, um, today is April 8th. It began uh, the day after Selection Sunday, so that Monday. Today is day 22, Monday. So we're like right, just one day shy of the halfway point. Day 45 is going to come on May 1st. So just keep your eyes out on that. And as a reminder, you don't have to commit to a school by day 45. You just have to have entered into the transfer portal by day 45. You technically can still enter afterwards, but you're not imme immediately eligible. At that point, you do have to wait uh, a year before being able to play. So that's where things are at right now. Just anytime there's roster movement, always want to update you on it. Now, we want to take a moment to celebrate some North Carolina history that's been made. Two more Carolina guys enter the Hall of Fame. RJ Davis racks up another accolade. And of course, we got a little bit of a weekend whip around to get to. We'll do all that in just a second. Every year at the Final Four, the Hall of Fame class for the next year is announced. And on Saturday at the Final Four, we learned that two more Tar Heels will be entering into the Naismith Memorial Basketball Hall of Fame. That is Vince Carter and Walter Davis, the uncle of head coach Hubert Davis, who, as you might remember, passed away this past November 2nd. Um, and so this is great news for the Tar Heels. This is their 13th and 14th individuals uh, to, to enter into the Hall of Fame, either as a player or a coach. That's the second most amongst all schools. Only Kansas has more with 20. However, it's the seventh and eighth Tar Heels who enter primarily as a player. That is the most of any school. You love to see that. Also, this is the ninth and 10th Hall of Famers who were coached by Dean Smith. No other coach has more in the Hall of Fame. Man, wild, wild stuff. The ceremony is going to be up in Springfield, Massachusetts on August 17th. And so that will be great stuff there. Uh, I want to take another moment to just recognize RJ Davis continuing to rack up hardware over the weekend. It was announced that he is the recipient of the Jerry West Award, which is the award for the top shooting guard in the nation. RJ is the first ever Tar Heel to win this award and deservedly so. I saw people on Twitter on Saturday 
who clearly have not watched any basketball, who are like, RJ Davis is a point guard. What are we doing here? Hello, my name is Elliot Cadeau, and I'd like you to meet me. I'm North Carolina's point guard. Meet my teammate, RJ Davis, the shooting guard. Sure, RJ took on some point guard responsibilities from time to time if Elliot was on the bench or whatever it is. That's what happens in basketball. So I don't know what we're doing here. Anyway, RJ, RJ was a shooting guard this year. Big time. Congrats to him. There's an award handed out to each of the five main positions, top point guard in the nation. That's the Bob Cousy Award, small forward, power forward, and center as well. But as I said, RJ is the first ever Tar Heel to win the shooting guard award, the Jerry West Award, which has been in existence since the 2014-15 season. Uh, a couple other backcourt Tar Heels that have won one of these awards before, Ray Felton in 05, Ty Lawson in 09, and Kendall Marshall in 2012 all won the Bob Cousy Award for the best point guard in the nation. But uh, great stuff from RJ. And so, by the way, the list of his accolades this season is bonkers. Let me just list for you some of what some of what RJ has done in the 2023-24 season. Consensus first team All-American, ACC player of the year, National Player of the Year finalist, four-time National Player of the Week, four-time ACC Player of the Week. This is all just this season. Again, remind you that. 784 points scored. That's the fourth most in a single season for North Carolina in history. Led the ACC scoring in terms of points per game, both in all games played and conference only games played. He set uh, a couple UNC single season records, most threes, all time 113. The previous record was 105 by Justin Jackson in the 2017 National Championship season. He also uh, set the record for average threes made per game at 3.05. That broke Shaman Williams' record of 2.71 from back in 96 97. So only Tar Heel ever to average three or more made threes a game. Insane. Um, it's the ninth most three-pointers made in an ACC single season history. Uh, and as you may remember or may know, Carolina played 37 games and RJ hit at least one three in 36 of those. Unfortunately, we all know the one game he did not make a three and we won't say any more about that game. Career high seven threes in the Miami game for RJ Davis. That was, oh, by the way, the same game in which he sent a uh, set a Smith Center record with 42 points. Wild stuff there. There was a period this season when he made 41 straight free throws, which tied a North Carolina record. Uh, fell off a little bit after that, but even still, as this season ends, he is the North Carolina all-time leader in free throw percentage for a career at 85.8%. He is second in career-made threes at North Carolina, has 274. Marcus Page is the all-time leader in that at 299. So if RJ chooses to come back, undoubtedly he will become the first Tar Heel ever to have 300 career three-pointers made. He is also currently fifth in scoring all-time at Carolina, 2,000. 88 points. That's a list he would obviously climb up as well if he came back for a fifth season. RJ Davis, what a year. Unreal stuff. I just hope we're all just able to start taking stock of what a truly, truly special year this was from RJ Davis and what a truly special career Armando Baycott just wrapped up. All right, weekend whip around. Let's get right to this thing. Baseball was at Virginia this weekend and unfortunately lost the series, this was a Thursday to Saturday instead of Friday to Sunday. Uh, kind of an offensive explosion on Thursday evening. The Tar Heels lost 11 to 14. Friday went down 2 to 7. And then thankfully Saturday squeezed out one win, 12 to 7. It allows the Cavs to make up some ground in the ACC Coastal, but still pretty far behind the Tar Heels. The team that's neck and neck with North Carolina right now is Virginia Tech. Uh, depending on what Virginia Tech does on Sunday, I haven't seen their result yet. Carolina will either be one game ahead of them in the division standings or tied. And so great, great spot there. Um, for softball, they've been playing at number two Duke this weekend, lost Friday four to six, got skunked Saturday zero to eight. And Sunday is a night game and I'm recording Sunday afternoon actually. So we don't have that result yet. Women's tennis uh, hosted both of the ACC Virginia schools this weekend. 
beat Virginia on Friday 4-1 to one, and blanked Virginia Tech on Sunday on Senior Day. Great stuff there, 4 to nothing. So uh, just see how the ladies will keep rolling. The men, unfortunately, lost at number 17 Duke on Saturday 2-5. to five. Men's golf. This team is rolling. Please can this be the year they finally get over the hump and get that national championship. They secured on Sunday their sixth tournament of the season, shot a, t- a collective minus 21 at the Augusta, Augusta Haskins Award uh, invitational stuff there. Texas came in second at minus 15. After Saturday was the first two rounds. After Saturday, the guys were leading by 10 strokes over uh, Texas, Augusta, Oklahoma State, and Illinois, among others. So really, really good stuff from the men. They will continue to track their progress. Over to lacrosse, the women won 13-9 against Virginia Tech on Saturday. This was like the Virginia weekend for Carolina Athletics, apparently, because the men lost at Virginia 6-14. to Track was at the Hurricane Alumni Invitational this weekend, had 10 top five finishers, including Craig Sadler II, who won the men's 400 meter. Way to go, Craig. Love that. And gymnastics has been at the NCAA Regionals down in Gainesville, Florida this weekend. So there's your weekend whip around. Great stuff from the Tar Heels all around. Obviously, there were a few less than desirable results, but all in all, a good weekend and great news from RJ and the Hall of Fame announcement as well. So we will continue to keep our eyes on all the roster movement for basketball and see where things go with that. You know I'm going to keep you up to date all the time on that. And if you want to be immediately up to the date, up to date, make sure you are in on the Locked on Tar Heels Discord community where we're talking Carolina stuff all day, every day. The link for that's in the show notes. We'd love to have you come for the Tar Heels, stay for the community. If you're not subscribed on YouTube and audio, please do that right now. It's so very easy to do. By the way, on YouTube, hit that little bell notification because you're not going to want to miss a second if news breaks anytime in the coming weeks and I go live. If you've hit that bell, it will notify you that I'm going live so we can get in on that information together. You guys, it's always a great day to be a Tar Heel. We'll talk again tomorrow on Tuesday. But until then, peace.